Thanks, Lisa. It's great to be here. It's great to be at any independent bookstore in the United States. So I'm very, very happy to have these kinds of events. Keep it going. And, you know, I'm also happy, but I've stopped being surprised to see a whole bunch of people deciding that the best way they can spend their Thursday evening is thinking about the beginning of the universe and the origin of time. But I do, I do need to explain, you know, part of why this particular question is the question we're being asked. At one point, you know, I mentioned to a student that I was thinking about, as Lisa said, why time runs forward rather than backwards. And the response was, and after that, you will tackle the problem of alphabetical order. <laughs> I mean, how could it else run? You might have heard of Einstein. Einstein told us, among other things, uh, that time is kind of like space. One of Einstein's great intuitions is that what we ordinarily in our everyday lives think of as space and time, which seem completely different to us, are in fact part of one thing called space-time, one four-dimensional thing. Space is three-dimensional. Space is just where we move and where we live, the world around us. And when we say it's three-dimensional, we mean there's sort of three independent directions you can go. We can go forward, backwards, right, left, up, and down. So to pick out a point in space, you need to give me three numbers. Where is it this way? Where is it this way? Where is it that way? But if you want to meet somebody, if you want to meet somebody for coffee, or if you want to be at a book reading, you need to not only pick out a point in space, you also have to give them the moment in time. So in a very, very trivial, simple way, we live in a four-dimensional universe. There's three dimensions of space around us. There's one dimension of time. But there is something deeper going on than that, because Einstein says that not only are there four dimensions, not only is time a dimension just like space is, but the division of four-dimensional space-time into three dimensions of space and one dimension of time is kind of arbitrary. Different people will divide it up different ways. Different people will, moving at different speeds, will decide that space is completely different, that a, a simultaneous moment many, many light years away is different to one person than another person. What I want to do is not talk about that. What I want to talk about is the fact that nevertheless, despite the fact that Einstein made all these great advances and we now think of time and space as two different reflections of the same underlying reality, nobody ever confuses time with space. Okay? You might be driving around a neighborhood that you don't understand very well and you might make a left turn where you wanted to take a right turn. No one ever makes a wrong turn into yesterday when they wanted to go to tomorrow. So time is clearly not exactly the same as space. And so what is it? What is this difference? Why do we never have the danger of mixing up time and space in our everyday lives? Well, there's many different reasons, uh, different answers to that question, depending on how deep you want to go. But the basic difference is that time, unlike space, has a direction. That if you're floating out in space, really far away from the Earth or far away from any other object, you're just floating in your astronaut spacesuit, you would not be able to tell the difference between up, down, left, right, forward, backwards. Every direction would be equally as good as every other direction. But yesterday and tomorrow would still be different. There's all sorts of ways in which the past is different from the future. Space does not have a direction, but time has what we call an arrow. There's an arrow pointing from the past to the future. In fact, some people talk about lots of different arrows of time, and that's a little bit confusing. There's really one thing going on that gets manifested in many, many different ways. We remember yesterday. We do not remember tomorrow. I hope no one in the room remembers what is going to happen tomorrow. Uh, we are born as young people, and we grow older. No matter what you might have seen in the curious case of Benjamin Button, in the real world, everyone ages in the same direction. So as a scientist, we want to understand this uniformity of our experience. Causes precede effects. We start young, we grow old, we accumulate memories. We have a feeling that we pass through time from the past into the future. So we would like to explain that scientifically. There's no arrow of space. There's no direction that points out in space, but there is an arrow of time. And why is that? Well, it all comes down to something called entropy. And entropy was sort of put together in the early 19th century, over 150 years ago, for fundamentally nationalistic reasons. 
The reason why scientists invented entropy is because the French were annoyed that the British were building better steam engines than they were. In the 19th century, you know, they were, the Industrial Revolution was going on. The English, with James Watt, had the best steam engines going around, and some of the French scientists were a little bit irked by this. So they asked themselves, Saji Carnot is the one name that comes to mind, he asked himself, how could I possibly build the world's most perfect steam engine? He's very practical, you know, he's not thinking about the origin of the universe or anything like that. He wanted to build an engine that would get the most oomph out of a certain amount of fuel. But he ended up, you know, as you often do in these practical situations, you end up thinking big. You start, you know, thinking about the most abstract thing you can possibly do. And Carnot figured out exactly how you could have the most efficient engine possible. But what he realized is that there's no such thing as a perfectly efficient engine. You can't get all of the energy out of something and put it to useful work. Why not? Well, he said, there's some sort of tendency of things in the universe to wind down. The universe is kind of like a wind-up toy that ticks along and it sort of declines with time and eventually it will stop. So this got codified into a law of nature, the second law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics says that energy is conserved. The total energy of the universe doesn't change. That makes sense. The second law says there's this thing called entropy, and entropy goes up. So that's where the arrow of time comes from, is that when you compare the past to the future, the future has more entropy. So what is entropy? The great thing is that Carnot was able to invent the concept of entropy and tell us that it increases without really knowing what it meant. <laughs> it was years later that we figured out what entropy meant. But the basic idea of entropy is something to do with disorder. So if you have an office and you neatly stack papers on your desk, they're all organized and they're nice and neat, that is low entropy, that's organized. If you wait around, people come into your office, they bump into things, you don't try to clean things up, that stack of papers is going to scatter, it's going to become more disorganized, and we say that the entropy has increased. So the entropy is something that measures how messy something is, how disorganized or disorderly. And so you know then from your everyday experience that entropy, if it's disorderliness, is something that goes up left to its own devices. You're not surprised if you start with a nice neat stack of papers or books and they become scattered. You'd be very, very surprised if you scattered papers across your desk and as people came into the room, they gently nudged them here or there and they all came up into one little pile like that. That is the arrow of time. It's easy to go from stacked and organized to messy. It's hard to go from messy to neatly stacked. So the question is, can we really make this quantitative? Can we really turn this into something scientific? And that was done by a man named Ludwig Boltzmann in the late 19th century, in the 1870s. And what Boltzmann did, that his advantage over his fellow physicists of the day, was that Boltzmann believed in atoms. Okay, as late as the 1870s, many physicists didn't believe that atoms existed. They said, look, you're inventing these little things. I don't see any atoms. I can't tell that they're there. I can't observe them. Physics should not talk about unobservable things. This is a little bit of rhetoric that goes down to the ages and we're still dealing with today. There's a, there's a tension between people who want to explain things in the simplest possible way and people who say, or more down to earth, and say, if I can't see it, I'm not going to believe that it's there. But Boltzmann said, look, if you believe in atoms, then atoms are, make up everything. Atoms are in every single object. And we can use the same logic that we use for the pieces of paper neatly stacked and apply them to every object in the universe. We can say that the entropy, the messiness, counts the number of ways that we can rearrange the atoms in something. So for example, if you have a glass of water with an ice cube in it, one manifestation of the arrow of time is that ice cubes melt, right? You start with a warm glass of water, you put the ice cube in it, you let it go all by itself, the ice cube will cool off the water around it. 10 minutes later, you have a cool glass of water. Now, you put a cool glass of water down there, wait 10 minutes, it's not gonna form an ice cube, okay, all by itself, that never happens. The arrow of time going this way goes from ice cube to melted, never backwards. So, if this story I'm telling you holds together, entropy increases when the ice cube melts. And Boltzmann said, 
look, I had the ice. It's made of atoms, molecules, we would say now, but he called them atoms. The water is also made of atoms. But when it's an ice cube, the ice cube molecules are different than the water molecules. They're colder, right?